in a good way. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I want to I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. I'm really honored to be part of this. It's a great thing, and uh, and I'm happy that I could drive over to be to be here. Um, and I'm just back from France, like just 24 hours back from France. So. I'll try to remain standing. I'm going to talk quite a bit about the early Earth uh, in this discussion, but what I really want to do is make sure that you keep track all the way through, of the, uh, and, uh, and we'll hit it pretty hard at the end, that the central theme really is about trying to develop models for exploring bio, for biosignatures in exoplanet atmospheres. And Stephanie Olson is here, who's been very much part of this, and, and uh, Eddie Sweeterman wishes he could be here, and he sends his apologies. And so I'll give you a little bit of context of how we use the Earth and how we got to where we are now and hope to go forward. My own pathway in all of this is, is really very indirect. I started as a geological engineer by training, and then I did a chemical oceanography PhD in the Black Sea. Many of you will know that's the world's largest oxygen-free basin. And so it's something that we studied to develop models for trying to, to explore a condition that's much more common, in fact, dominant over most of Earth's history. Today, it's quite rare. but but in the past, it was really very common. And through some sort of blind luck, I ended up working on Precambrian rocks in the middle 90s when it was a fairly esoteric thing to do. But along came the Astrobiology Institute in 1998, and suddenly studying these different chapters of Earth history became really a centerpiece in, in developing exploration tools for Mars, other places in the solar system, and increasingly, as the VPL has demonstrated as well, uh, exoplanets. So I'm now leading one of the astrobiology teams, a CAN-17 based out of Riverside, but has partnerships with Yale and uh, Georgia Tech and a number of other institutions. And I'll address a little bit at the end about how we're, we're going forward with all of this. So I also have to mention, because I'm a child of the right age, um, we're, tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of the launch of Apollo 11. And of course, Saturday is the 50th anniversary of the landing. And so I would say that I'm looking at Ken, he probably is relating to this as well. I would say that much of who I am today is because I grew up toward during an extraordinary time. And I would say from what I've heard already and what I know all of you are doing, this is another extraordinary time between the ocean worlds and Mars research and exoplanet research and, and many other things. I've never really been quite so excited about all the things that are happening other than maybe this very early time in my childhood. So the, the coming days feel kind of heady for me, and I'm sure they will. Other people will allude to this, or you'll all be thinking about it, either from your direct experience, from what your parents told you, or maybe from what you read. And this pathway from, from engineer to sedimentologist to ocean, ocean chemist to Precambrian geologist, of course, like all of you, it, it involves so many people. And I would say that I, I could spend the entire hour filling the, the board with names and pictures of people that I have to thank. But I'd be really remiss if I didn't mention my two former students, Noah Planaski and Chris Reinhardt. Noah's at Yale now, and Chris is at Georgia Tech. Uh, much of what you'll see today in terms of developing novel proxy approaches to understanding ancient Earth, and then it's sort of extrapolating those into model space, those are really fortes of Chris and Noah. And then Stephanie Olson, who came along a little bit after the two of them, and you'll hear from her later in the week. Um, she, among many things, brought the, the Genie Ocean model to our mix. And so we, as a team, perhaps do best studying ancient oceans and, and understanding the relationship between the ocean and the atmosphere and the life within those oceans. And we think about the Earth a lot, but we're always trying to extrapolate that far beyond. And when we promised to do all this, that is the extrapolation into exoplanets, it was contingent really on us being able to do real exoplanet work. And at that time, we didn't really have membership on our team. But happily, Vicki and I overlapped through the NAI Executive Council. And so we have very strong ties. I'm part of the VPL, and, and many of others in our team are part of the VPL. I'm indirectly part of Nexus through that. And that led to Vicki's student, Eddie Sweeterman, coming to Riverside, who's now joining our faculty and has brought all the remarkable code that has been developed by Vicki and others at the VPL and the addition of Stephen Kane, who is obviously a real card-carrying exoplanetary scientist, the addition of Stephen to our faculty as well. So such is the impact that it's had on campus that we've become an Earth and planetary science department while we were just Earth before. So exciting times now and exciting times in the future. And I want to just capture some of the highlights of that. NASA, I think, wisely 
addressed early on in the beginning of the Nestor, at the Astrobiology Institute and even before that through exobiology and other programs that, that we really do need to study the Earth if we're going to develop search engines for looking for life elsewhere in the solar system and beyond our solar system. But what our team has tried to take the position and others have in particular the University of Washington, but there have been different teams throughout the history of the NAI that have done the same thing. We've tried to imagine that the Earth has really been many, many different planets. Um, we're not just thinking about the Earth as we know it today, but we're thinking about the Earth as best as we can unravel it from its past. And so our goal really is to explore four billion years of persistent habitability on a dynamic early Earth to guide NASA's mission-specific search for life on distant worlds, and in particular, biosignature gases in exoplanet atmospheres. Um, and so, what perfect setup I couldn't have asked for anymore between Kevin's talk and Dustin's just before, and so I'm not going to give you a long history of the Hadean. What you should have gotten out of those, and I'm sure you did because they were so wonderfully presented, is that Earth's early history suffered many offenses. Uh, those offenses both, both fostered and perhaps hindered the development of life, and Kevin and Dustin went through many different scenarios. But certainly, we would all agree that the view of the Hadean, which comes from Hades, this hellish view of the early Earth, and this idea of persistent magma oceans and our much closer moon and frequent impacts, the, the, this place of inhospitability is not something that we think about very much anymore. And Dustin covered beautifully the zircon records that put some kind of hydrology, surface water, perhaps oceans on our planet, starting as early as 4.3 or even 4.4 billion years ago and persisting all the way to the present. So a, a remarkable planet that we have sustained oceans uh, for all of this time in the face of a warming sun and a cooling interior, a fundamental shift in our redox at about two and a half billion years ago from being completely reducing to completely oxidizing. You're all smart people. You can imagine what that does to the greenhouse gas balance as you make methane very stable and then very much less stable. And so through it all, we have been this wonderful place to develop and evolve life. And so the history of oxygenation on Earth has traditionally been viewed pretty simplistically, but in, in many ways, I think accurately, as a two-step process. And the first of those steps has, has traditionally been placed at about two and a half billion years ago, the so-called Great Oxidation Event, where we went from an atmosphere that had very little oxygen, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how little it did based on some more modern constraints, to an atmosphere that had more oxygen, okay? And that's kind of how it was at that time. Imagining that, imagine that it went from a reducing world to an oxidizing world. And that was based on many decades of research using largely observational sedimentological criteria like the disappearance of detrital pyrite and other reduced minerals like siderite, uh, the distribution of banded iron formations, um, and, 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 and so, the distribution of red beds, which would be consistent with a more oxidizing environment, although we, don't, we know that you don't need a lot of oxygen to oxidize the surface. But again, that, that's been with us for a very, very long time. And, 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 and really, I would say less constrained is the second step in oxygenation. Um, around the traditional view would have been around 600 to 700 million years ago, what we call the Neoproterozoic, or the later portion of the Neoproterozoic. And ironically, one of the principal arguments for this rise is the appearance of animals uh, and the oxygen demands that animals have. Yet one of the big debates in my field right now is whether the appearance of animals had anything to do with the rise of oxygen. So was, there is this kind of circular, uh, circularity to this reasoning. And I will present independent evidence for this rise of oxygen around 800 million years ago. And I'll draw connections to the changes of life at that time, and I'll leave it to us to discuss further the cause and effect relationships. And so the, the beginnings of, of oxygen, oxygenesis, biological oxygen production on, on Earth, is, is something that is a, is a great prize. And when I first got into this field, the, the traditional view was that it went back at least 2.7 billion years ago based on biomarker records in this famous Broxidol paper. Now, these, these organic compounds were steranes that were tied ultimately to sterols and therefore eukaryotic organisms, so organisms like us that require oxygen, and also hopinoids. So these were tied to cyanobacteria that are the oxygen producers. So it was imagined based on this record from 2.7 billion years ago that we had both organisms that could produce oxygen and organisms that required oxygen. 
Now that's a remarkable claim really because these rocks are very old and they're very metamorphosed. The risk of contamination is very high. You have to fast forward about a billion years before you see fossil evidence for eukaryotic life. And so Jochen Brox, as early as, well, the next couple of years following 1999, was already challenging his own work. He thought that these were contamination. In retrospect, when you look at the data, there are huge abundances of stearanes that look more like Mesozoic rocks than what you might have ever imagined in the Archean. But it pushed forward, and it sort of drove a stake in many, many different views of the world. And one of those principal ideas was that oxygen production began in earnest on Earth before it started to accumulate in the atmosphere. So that spawned all sorts of ideas, some of which you've heard today, or relationships to what you've heard today, and that is reduced gas fluxes, reductants that would have buffered oxygen that was being released through the burial of, of, of cyanobacterial biomass, would have kept the accumulation at bay until eventually the production term swamped the sink term. And hydrogen es escape has also been tied to this. Well, fast forward a number of years in the Agaron Institute, which is based here in Pasadena, and, and they have deep enough pockets where they said, let's go redrill that site in Western Australia in the Pilbara Craton. Let's do it cleanly with water. We'll pay the drillers extra. Let's position the sampling um, uh, downwind from the, uh, from, the drill, from the drill diesel engines. Let's immediately freeze samples and bring them on the plane to Australia to process. Let's spend weeks looking at contamination issues. It, it was, it's the most scrupulous set of uh, procedural set ever taken for the generation of organic data. And, and many of you will know that through that process, what was demonstrated is that all the claims of Brox 99 were contamination. Okay, So none of the sterine records, none of the hopane records withstood that test and happily, and I think a statement of the way science should be, um, there's a lot of author overlap, right? So Brox is part of that, and Roger Summons, and Roger Buick. And it was really a, a make a great book, the study of how these people came to terms with what was arguably, for them, their seminal paper that they just simply had to say was wrong, okay? And, and that should be something maybe we all have to face, right? Or at least be willing to face. And, and I would say that in truth, as I'll, I'll make the case in a second, that they were probably right for the wrong reasons, um, that there probably was oxygen production long before the great oxidation event, and that probably it was risky to use organic biomarkers in rocks that had such potential for contamination both post-collection and during the time, the long history in the ground, and you lose these records through the, through the offenses of plate tectonics, metamorphism, heat, pressure. And so what I want to do is just give you one example of kind of where we think that oxygenesis may have started. It's always hard to know if you have the oldest, right? You can never really know that, but you can know if you have something pretty old until somebody else finds something that's even older. And so we looked at rocks at the 2.95 billion year old Pongola supergroup in South Africa. And what we said with these rocks is that we're going to use inorganic techniques. We think it's really problematic to get organic data out of rocks this old. Uh, in my opinion, there aren't really any viable biomarker records from the Archean. Brox and Gordon Love would tell you that the first convincing biomarkers are 1.64 billion years old from the Barney Creek. And so it, it's a tough time to do organic work, but maybe a little less tough for doing inorganic work. And so I give you this, this is one of the more complicated things I'm gonna show you through the whole talk, just because I want you to kind of see how our brains work. And the, and, and, and the indirect approaches, in a sense, that we have to take to be able to come up with what are very important but very challenging answers. And the long story short on this is that we've done a lot of work with molybdenum isotopes, okay? And, and this is something that you can measure with a multi-collector ICPMS. It's a pretty routine measurement right now. And one of the things that we know pretty clearly from experimental work is that when, whoops, uh-oh. One of the things we know pretty clearly is that when molybdenum in seawater, and it's the most abundant transition metal in the ocean today, when molybdenum absorbs onto manganese and iron oxides, but particularly, particularly manganese oxides, there's a very strong preference for the light isotope. And so we can, we can model the, the redox state of the ocean by, uh, by assessing the isotope value of seawater and the relative absorption onto manganese oxide through time. And so the, the approach that we took with this is that when manganese oxidizes, we argued O2 must be present, and that these manganese oxides would then scavenge molybdenum, preferentially favoring the light isotope, and that in a sample, the higher the manganese concentration, even if it's not manganese oxide anymore, the higher the manganese concentration, 
the lighter the isotope value should be. And we found this beautiful relationship in these 2.95 billion year old rocks, but for many other formations of similar and, and younger ages. And, and we concluded that in these shallow waters of the ocean going back 3 billion years ago, that there was enough oxygen to oxidize manganese to oxides and scavenge molybdenum and bury that molybdenum and give us this relationship that could sustain over time. So if that seems complicated, it is, right? And so that shows you the sorts of things that have to be done to go after these, these difficult questions. So we have over time been refining our oxygen curve. It still has the basic two steps. I published this in, in 2014, but I've, I've changed things around a little bit. It's like, you know, it's so crazy. It's like if somebody said to you, what is, what is the condition of the ocean over the last 500 million years? You'd say, well, what time period? Well, it's the same thing here. We can never imagine generalizing multi-billion years of a given state in the ocean. And so over time, it gets more texture and we use more and more different approaches to try and figure it all out. And so the great oxidation event is still there. It's placed now very well with mass independent sulfur fractionation at about 2.3 to 2.4 billion years ago. I'll show you those data in a second. And I'll show you data at the end that show us the second jump in oxygenation at around 800 million years ago. But what I wanna do now, just to give you again a flavor of the approaches that we can take is talk a little bit about this, this period that's one of my favorites and I think Stephanie would agree as well. It's called the boring billion because it has a very flat carbon isotope expression. Eukaryotic life appears, but it seems challenged in some way. You don't see great diversification. I'll show you some records of that in a second. But it is anything but boring. It's remarkable, perhaps, for its stability. Uh, but it's actually, as most things are, when you look in detail, more varied than people had imagined. So let's think a little bit about this boring billion period. Well, one of the things we want to know is how much oxygen was in the atmosphere. That's a really hard thing to constrain. The Archean, I'll show you the data in a second. Before this time period, we know that oxygen was a tiny fraction of what it is today because of the abundance of this mass-independent sulfur fractionation. But once you lose that at about 2.3 billion years ago, you're hard-pressed to come up with any way of, to quantify oxygen in the atmosphere. A popular idea developed first by Fry et al. in 2009 and something that we've picked up with in earnest is using chromium isotopes. The long story short on chromium isotopes is that when, when, when manganese oxidizes, again in the presence of, of, of uh, O2, we get these manganese oxides and these manganese oxides can aggressively drive chromium oxidation. So imagine in the soil, chromium-3 is put into solution under acidic soil conditions. And then in the presence of enough oxygen and enough manganese oxide, you get oxidation to chromium-6, and then perhaps some re-reduction of the chromium-6 during transport to the ocean. What you need to know about this is that the fractionations of chromium isotopes are associated with this redox cycling, with the oxidation and reduction. And so in a first order sense, you might imagine that when oxygen is high enough in the atmosphere to oxidize manganese to generate these oxides in the soils and drive this cycling of chromium in a redox sense, that, that might be telling us something about fundamentally um, the evolution of, of our redox. And so that's exactly what we did. We started collecting all sorts of rocks, first iron banded iron formations, but, but more so in recent times, black shales, which also are archives of seawater chromium isotope compositions. And I just really wanna draw your attention to this remarkable boring billion window where we don't see chromium isotope fractionation until 800 million years ago and yet we have the disappearance of the mass independent sulfur fractionation at 2.3. I mean, you just look at that and say, well, we can quibble about how much oxygen was in this time, but it's gonna be something pretty interesting. And so the, the traditional view would be that oxygen, because you lose mass independent sulfur fractionation, the blue data is greater than 0.001% of the present atmospheric level. But because we don't see chromium fractionation, and if you believe, and that's a leaf of faith, if you accept the models that we've done for soils and how much manganese is oxidized, et cetera, this window, in the, because of the absence of chromium isotope fractionation, would be less than 1% present atmospheric level. So you're in this really sort of critical time. It's, it's higher than here. It's that, that middle level between the two steps. It's higher than before and lower than after. And so you could imagine that a world that had low oxygen in the atmosphere also had low oxygen in the ocean. And so we've spent a lot of time, this goes back to my days in the Black Sea, thinking about metal abundances in the ocean. Now this story is pretty straightforward, even if you don't think very geochemically. The idea is that once the atmosphere becomes oxidizing enough, 
and this may have happened even in the late portions of the Archean, once the atmosphere became oxidizing enough, sulfide minerals in particular that bear a broad range of trace elements were, were uh, sulfide minerals were oxidized and the associated trace elements were remobilized and transported towards the ocean where they could start to build up an ocean inventory of different trace metals. Now you can imagine that that would just build up over time, higher and higher and higher under an oxidizing atmosphere. But the truth is we have really important sink terms and those sinks are in particular associated with reducing environments like the modern Black Sea. The Black Sea loves to bury molybdenum and vanadium and uranium and all these different elements that would have been sourced into the ocean. And so at the end of the day, the enrichment that you see in a shale at any given time is gonna reflect the fact that you have an oxidizing atmosphere, but also how much of the ocean was anoxic. Really simple, it's just a simple mass balance. And so I tend to think of it this way, when there's very little of the ocean that favors molybdenum uptake like the Black Sea does today, then you get lots of enrichment. But when a broad portion of the ocean, as would be true for much of Earth's history, can do that, then the enrichment patterns are much smaller. And so it's enriched, it was anoxic, it was potentially sulfide containing, something we call eugenic, but the fact that these enrichments are smaller at certain times than others tells us how much of the ocean favored that process. And so I had to show you this as a proof of concept. This is one of the famous oceanic anoxic events of the Cretaceous, OAE2, a record data set from Demerara Rise from the Proto-North Atlantic. And it was locally anoxic in hydrogen sulfide containing before the famous OAE, and you see very high molybdenum concentrations. But as you go into the OAE, they actually crash, and all the other metals show the same thing, those concentrations, and then they rise again. And so the easiest interpretation of this is that you have local anoxia, sulfitic conditions, and then much of the ocean was pulling down the inventory, this, this red bar that you're seeing then, and then it went back to local conditions. That's really powerful. You don't need a multi-collector to make this measurement. It's simple mass balance, understanding the source and sinks rela relationships. Now, looking through time, we see this in, in pretty much every transition metal that we look at. Here is the Archean. We see very low concentrations of uranium. I could show vanadium. I could show molybdenum. They all show the same pattern. These enrichments in black shales independently constrained to have been deposited under anoxic conditions using what we call iron speciation. So we're comparing apples to apples. During the Archean, we see a reservoir enrichment patterns that are really limited by the oxidative weathering. So there just isn't much going to the ocean. And then when we cross the great oxidation event, remember again, that's about 2.3 to 2.4 billion years ago, we see a big jump. And remarkably in these data, we see a suggestion that oxygen rose and then fell again. This is something people call the Loma Gundi interval. It has a, a very high positive carbon isotope um, expression. So oxygen may have actually gotten high. Some people speculate even modern-like. I don't accept that, but it was clearly higher than it was before and after. And then it dropped again. And how much it dropped is anybody's guess, but, but we think that it dropped dramatically. Remember, I showed you the chromium data, so it may have dropped to less than 1% of, uh, of the present atmospheric level. And much of the ocean may have still been anoxic. And it's only at the end of the Precambrian, the, 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 uh, the, the Proterozoic, as we call it, something like five to 600 million years ago that you start to see values like you see over the rest of Earth's history. So these simple metal abundances in shales are telling us something about the redox evolution or landscape of the ocean. And so we've come up with a model where the deep ocean and others have come independently to the same point. So this is pretty widely accepted now for those of you who are thinking about life in early oceans. The deep ocean was probably iron rich, not just in the Archean, but also in the Proterozoic and potentially extending into the Phanerozoic. Those are buzzwords. What I'm really telling you is that for over 80 to 90% of Earth's history, the deep ocean may have been dominated by an absence of oxygen and a richness in iron, dissolved iron. Ken likes iron. <laughs> and this condition like we have in the Black Sea where there's not only a lack of oxygen, but hydrogen sulfide present, was probably quite limited to the margins, still much more than it is today, but not the Canfield Ocean that we all learned about where sulfide was everywhere in the ocean. Iron was the dominant state. And so we use these enrichment patterns. Chris did a really nice job of modeling this in a paper that we published in PNAS. And, and long story short, by just simply looking at the, the enrichment patterns and making some assumptions about fluxes using modern systems, we concluded that, well, it becomes sort of asymptotic, but maybe all of the deep ocean was, was anoxic and iron rich.
and that these sulfitic or euxinic portions of the ocean, this wedge that I'm showing here, may have only been 1 to 10 percent of the ocean. Today, that condition is really rare. It occurs in the Black Sea, in the Carioco Basin off of Venezuela, some fjords. It's much, much less than 1 percent. During this time period, these wedges on productive margins were pretty common. And so this is a really interesting ocean in terms of you know, what it's doing for cycling, in terms of cycling elements, something that Jen cares a lot about, the, the N2O, the nitrogen cycle in an ocean like this, um, trace metal availability, metals that are essential cofactors for a lot of enzymes. All of these would be affected by this particular kind of ocean. And where I'm going to take you with this is that it also affects what we imagine the atmosphere was like at that time and what kind of biosignature gases might have been present within those atmospheres. And so these are a lot of data, but I'm trying to overwhelm you with the sheer volume and diversity of data types that point to the jump at 800. So these are zinc isotope data. That This would be a whole other talk, but we published this paper about a year ago. Zinc isotopes, we think, are actually tracking specifically the burial of algal biomass. Algae use eukaryotes use zinc very much more to much higher degrees than prokaryotic organisms. There would be some exceptions, but think of zinc utilization as being really a eukaryotic thing. There's a negative fractionation, and for the first time in Earth history, we see this positive kick in zinc isotopes. So it's not the beginning of eukaryotic life, but it's the beginning of abundant eukaryotic life, when the ocean may have had a shift from fundamentally prokaryotic biomass to something that would be more like today, which would contain abundant algal life. And then we see lots of other trace metals all jumping up at around 800. And we can talk about why it, there's a lag for vanadium and a lag for uranium. It's probably because the deepest portions of the ocean stayed anoxic, while the sulfitic portions on the margins went away. We can really structure what the ocean might have been like during that time. And so just to give you a sense of the, the co-evolution of life during this time period. Now, early on, and I, I, Diane, I always think of Diane Newman from here, who is, I don't know if Diane's here today, but she, she always early on emphasized this, and it's so obvious to us now, but this idea that, that the, environment drives, it, it, the our environment drives evolution of life, but the evolution of life drives the environment, right? And the obvious one is the appearance of oxygenesis and cytobacteria, but in so many ways, it's a cause and effect relationship. And those cause and effect relationships, chicken and egg arguments, are debated still all the time, in particular with regard to animals. So just to give you some nuggets to take home to friends and families about, about what some of the milestones in life might be, and there were some really nice, Dustin, for example, really nicely covered some of the early histories of life. What I'm going to do is start at about 18, uh, 1.8 billion years ago, and I'm going to tell you that the popular idea is that eukaryotic fossil evidence appears at about 1.6 to 1.7 billion years ago. That's pretty consistent with the molecular clocks. So there's not a huge amount of debate about that. So those are stem group eukaryotes. We have evidence for multicellularity as early as 1.5, 1.6. Crown group eukaryotes, those are ones that have an affinity to, to extant, to modern organisms. They started around 1.1, Nick Butterfield's famous work on, what he had, on organisms that he ascribed to modern red algae. And so we have eukaryotes appearing during this time period, but if you squint hard enough, you might imagine that the diversities are generally low, and that at 800, 800 million years ago, things change. We have evidence for predation. We see, and it's, it's a tricky business assessing eukaryotic diversity through time, but we accept that there's a big change at 800. At the same time, when all those geochemical data suggested that the world may have taken a step up in oxygenation. Also at this time, and this is a really important thing because people always want to know these details. Brox, Love, all the people who do this work best in my opinion would argue that there is no organic biomarker evidence for eukaryotic life before around 800 million years ago. So even though you're getting the fossils appearing through this window, their abundances are low enough. There's even been a suggestion that they were eukaryotes that didn't produce sterols. That's possible. But there is no viable, believable record of sterines until you get to around 800, which is also where you see the zinc isotopes. So we take that as an argument as a mass balance. Eukaryotes are suddenly becoming abundant. They're suddenly becoming an important part of carbon burial. And, and through that, impacting the atmosphere through, for example, the release of oxygen. So this is a really dramatic time, and, and, and the thing that follows that you might predict from all of this 
This cryogenian is bracketed by the, the Sturdian and the Maranoan snowball Earth glaciation. So the most famous glacial times in Earth history. And right in the middle of that, probably not coincidental, is the first evidence, the first believable evidence for animals. So these are organic records that come from Amman. They're sterine compounds that have been tied specifically to sponges and more specifically to demo sponges. Gordon has followed up with this work. There's a nature ecology paper published just this past year. So this is pretty widely accepted. And so that's between six and 700 million years ago. Again, redox seems to be changing fundamentally around that time. And it's not until after the Maranoan glaciation and something that we call the, the, the Ediacaran that you start to see evidence for fossils, okay? So it's not true that fossils only appear at 540 million years ago. These soft body Ediacaran fossils have been described from throughout the world. These are from Newfoundland, a mistaken point, and this is an example of Dickinsonia from the sa famous Flinders locations in, in, um, in south, south Central Australia. So we have, I won't go through the details, but we've been looking in, 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 in really great detail at different geochemical indicators for the possibility of dynamic redox through this time, and whether these animals are responding or potentially driving those changes. Stephanie has a lovely paper looking at evidence for the first burrowing of organisms and how that seems to relate to independent chemical records of oxygenation. Okay. And then, of course, June is, is, is part of our team and will be going forward, I hope, <laughs> as we think about as we think about the drivers, the first order controls on these first order steps in redox. And a popular idea is that the breakup of Rodinian associated large igneous province activity, so large volcanic fields, massive fields that date independently from these time periods, could have driven this oxygenation. The large igneous provinces weather and, and yield phosphorus delivery to the ocean as an essential nutrient. And as continents are breaking up, you end up with basins, loci, where you can bury lots of organic matter. Because remember, the centerpiece of all of this is that it's the burial of organic matter produced by oxygenic photosynthesis that oxidizes our atmosphere. So if you're producing more during these time periods and burying it more efficiently, you can get a kick in oxygenation. This mid-proterozoic boring period actually had the, had the formation and breakup of a supercontinent as well, Nuna, or sometimes referred to as Columbia, and for reasons that no one understands, and maybe June will have an opinion about this over time going forward, it didn't have the same effect. We see little blips of oxygenation, but we see nothing like the big redox shift that we saw at 800. Okay, so just to end now, to think about how we can possibly use all of this to ever come up with some idea of, of what an exoplanet atmosphere might be like and what biosignature components might be within, within those atmospheres. And I would, I would like to really stress, and I think, I think Vicky's team would do the same thing, we're not looking for a mid-proterozoic Earth. It'd be nice if we saw one, but what we're really trying to do is understand how a planetary system works, a really good planetary system, one, one that's had oceans for all, almost all of its history, one that's had life for all of its history, one that has yielded biosignature gases almost all of its history, so how can we learn about the interlocking pieces of that system so that we can then, in computational space, reassemble them? Let's imagine a mid-proterozoic Earth where it's tidally locked, or where it's an ocean world, or change the obliquity, change the eccentricity. That's all the computational space that people like Stephanie and others, and many of you in the room, can move forward towards. But the Earth has given us this, again, this holistic sense of how a planetary system behaves and how, in particular, the life in the ocean affects the composition of the atmosphere. And so we've adopted what I, in a corny kind of way, call my vertical integration. Before Vicky and VPL and Eddie and others came along, we were really good at this stuff below the, the red line, okay? So we were really good at defining interesting chapters in Earth history and developing proxies for understanding what the atmosphere may have been like at that time. Uh, chromium, molybdenum, many, many zinc isotopes. These are pretty cutting edge, edge approaches. But what then Stephanie, I think, really brought to the mix as much as anyone, and then we hired Andy Ridgewell, and that helped as well, was bringing in 3D models to define ocean properties and fluxes to the atmosphere. So the Genie model, the CONOPS model that Chris developed with uh, Kazumi Ozaki, who's now back in Japan. And so what these really give us is for this overarching world that we imagine what the ocean was like. What was methane cycling like in this ocean? How was it affected by sulfate in ways that I'll discuss in a second? And what was the flux to the atmosphere? We could give you fluxes to the atmosphere. 
But what we couldn't really do until we had the computational power of all the strength of the DPL is start to think about what that express, how that expresses itself in gases through time. So we now we are able to do one and 3D photochemical models for these different gas combinations and flux relationships. We can generate synthetic spectra via, via radiative transfer models. And the thing that I find most striking is that we can then assess their detectability using telescope simulators. So with a mid-proterozoic atmosphere as we understand it, and the synthetic spectra that you could generate be detectable by James Webb or Louvoir or Habex. That's pretty cool, right? And that's, again, we're not just looking for that time period. We're looking for a building, a, a, a construction of all the different possibilities of a planet that could sustain habitability and life. And so just a few examples, and then I'll go ahead and end. I'm showing you this again because the first example I'm going to show you is from the, uh, the pre-GOE time. Remember, the great oxidation event was about 2.3 billion years ago. A rise in oxygen from something less than 0.001% of the modern to something greater than that. And so we'll talk about that. And I'll also show you some examples from our favorite time period, this boring billion where we have intermediate oxygen values of still to be accurately determined magnitude, but clearly something, a world that was really different than that was, that was present before and after. Okay, so this is really, hats, hats off to Stephanie. She, when she was at Penn State working with Jim Casting and Lee Kump, really, I think, made the case so compellingly that, that so much of the oxygen in the earliest Earth would have been concentrated in surface oceans. And we all imagine oxygen oases as existing, but I think a lot of people thought of them as just being little bubbles of oxygen above stromatolytic mats like Shark Bay in Australia. Really what these oases are, are productive portions of the ocean, vast portions of the ocean, like the Peru-Chile margin, the coast of California, areas where organic matter is produced and buried and released oxygen to the surface waters. And so it's very possible that there could have been massive amounts of surface oxygen in the ocean during the Archean. That would have allowed mass-independent sulfur fractionation to be sustained because the oxygen isn't in the atmosphere. But what is kind of scary about all of this is that it tells us is that, that biogenic oxygen may have predated remotely detectable atmosphere go to by 2 billion years, right? So we all worry about, and Vicky has made such important headway in this, the, the false positive for O2. We worry about the false negative, right? This idea that you may have had oceans teeming with life, including aerobic life, and not had a detectable biosignature for that within the atmosphere. And so the other thing that people talk often about is that the most oxygen-rich environments on Earth are within mats or within soil crusts. And so they can give you some of the oxidative processes that I've been talking about. They could skew some of our proxy understanding. And we would never really know it, and you would certainly never have detected it because it's really confined to the mats. And if you look at this concentration profile for oxygen, this is all reduced material above and below. The oxygen is consumed through respiration, decay of the mat, before it ever gets out. So again, this is a viable aerobic ecosystem that doesn't have a measurable signature in the atmosphere. And so all of this talk about oxygen, of course, makes us think more and more about what methane might be doing at this time. Uh, you've heard it over and over, you know this better than I do, that our sun has brightened over time, 70% is brightest present in its earliest history, and that the way that we maintain habitability are the ways that people like Kevin Zonley think about all the time, and that's through greenhouse gases, some combination in particular of CO2 and methane. And a very popular idea for the Archean is that there were very high levels of methane that compensated for the fainter sun at that time. And so people imagine an Archean world that may have looked like this, Methane concentrations high enough to ge generate orange hazes and an ocean dominated by ferrous iron rather than ferric iron that may have been green. So the press loves this, right? They love green oceans and orange skies, but it's not so far-fetched. It's really possible that the world may have been like that. But we, what we started to think about, and I say we, I mean all of us, but Stephanie in particular, working with Eddie and me and Chris Reinhardt, is, is what would the world in the mid-Proterozoic have been like? So what you have to imagine, again, is that the ocean during this boring billion time was mostly free of oxygen. Now, there are a lot of processes that are microbially driven that are anaerobic, like sulfate reduction. Much of the organic matter decay on Earth today happens anaerobically uh, in the absence of oxygen, but with abundant sulfate. Sulfate is the second most abundant anion in seawater today. So in many places on Earth, as much or organic matter is degraded, decomposed, through this process of sulfate reduction as that associated with aerobic decay. Sulfate is really important. 
Okay. The other thing that you need to see is that this is a delta G hierarchy. This is a competitive strategy. This is the most energetic process. These are the lower energetic processes. And so if you consume a lot of organic matter through sulfate reduction, you're leaving less available for the methanogens. The other thing that we've learned, because microbiologists have become really savvy, is that there is this anaerobic process of oxidation of methane, where it's a consortial relationship of microbes, where methane is oxidized at the expense of sulfate being reduced. So sulfate is a foe for both methane production and methane, production, uh, methane preservation because of AOM in terms of preservation and, and, and this, this relationship with sulfate reduction in terms of, in terms of production. So what Stephanie did is very cleverly model what the mid-proterozoic world might have been like. She also assumed, and I would stand by this assumption, that oxygen in the atmosphere was low enough that ozone shielding may not have been very strong. So we basically compounded these low fluxes into the atmosphere by low preservation potential because of photochemistry. And what we concluded ultimately is that methane was muted, that there may not have been very much methane in the mid-proterozoic. The sun was still faint, 80-some percent of modern, yet we had liquid oceans. We still don't understand now, really, that greenhouse mass balance. And so what it caused us to do is revisit, again, in this sort of false negative sense, one of the most famous biosignature scenarios something that Josh thinks about all the time, and that's the disequilibrium relationships, going back to Carl Sagan and others, that the coexistence of methane and reduced gas and oxygen and oxidizing gas puts some constraints on methane fluxes into that biosphere. And if you know what geology can do, and you can imagine that those fluxes aren't high enough, that the coexistence of these things, and Josh has done some of these calculations, the coexistence of these things, and, and you can make a similar argument for CO2, N2, methane, and the Archean, that those fluxes are probably uniquely biological. So it's not just about the presence, it's the rate of a flux that's required to maintain a given atmosphere. But what our work has shown us, if we're correct, and who knows, is that, is that perhaps in no time in Earth history was the methane O2 disequilibrium detectable. Kind of a scary thought. In the Archean, O2 was too low, methane was probably plenty high. In the mid-proterozoic, they may both have been too low. And then in the Phanerozoic, the last 500 million years, O2 was measurable, but not methane. And so what it's forced us to do, again, as we're redefining who we are, is to think about what's the silver lining to all of this. And Eddie and we and others have been pushing very hard on the possibility of ozone. So as O2 goes, so goes ozone through its atmospheric production. If you have UV capabilities, and we've written white papers on why telescopes should have that, if you have UV cap capabilities, then you just might be able to see all the history of O2 expressed in detectable O3. And we have even challenged, maybe that's the wrong word, but <laughs> been thinking about this, this really famous kind of anti-biosignature, and that's the presence of carbon monoxide. The story goes that when you have a buildup of carbon monoxide in the atmosphere, because of this biological reaction, acetogenesis, where CO is consumed um, and in, in the process, acetic acid is, 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 is produced, that if you have buildups of carbon monoxide, it, it, it makes, in a general sense, an argument, an argument against life. Um, now, of course, we tend to think of carbon monoxide as a toxin, and that's very much true for, for complex life, and we just wrote a paper about refining the habitable zone and a portion of the habitable zone that would not be well-suited for complex life because of carbon monoxide availability and very high CO2 on the outer edge of the habitable zone, hypercapnia. But this is different, right? We're talking about microbes that not only can tolerate, but that embrace carbon monoxide. And what this paper said is, let's take a look at a world that is informed by our understanding generally of the early Earth, and imagine that there are high methane flux, excuse me, I've done it again. Imagine that, um, that this H2, these high H2 levels that Kevin and others have spoken to in the atmosphere could have been supporting an H2-based photosynthesis in the surface ocean, that there's a lot of production of organic matter and associated methane, and that methane, once it vents into the ocean through, through photolysis, through, through photochemistry, can generate carbon monoxide. And so if we had an anaerobic world, if, if we had a reducing ocean, if we had a high enough abundance of H2, it's possible that we could not have only had CO, but very, had very high levels of CO. And in fact, it might have been a biosignature. So we demonstrated using a 1D ecosphere atmosphere model that anoxic biospheres, the anoxia is the critical thing, can easily sustain CO levels exceeding 100 ppm, even at low H2 fluxes, due to the impact of hybrid photosynthetic ecosystems. 
So it's, you know, what it is is really bringing the biology further and further and further into these discussions and, and the sorts of things you're going to be hearing about over the coming days. And then the final example, because I sit and I, and I tell my kids and, and anybody who will listen that we've done a pretty good job of demonstrating false negatives and, 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 and shedding some concerns about traditional approaches like the O2 methane disequilibrium. But I always take that as a call to, a call to, to order, to charge. Because what it means is that we have to be more clever in the way that we think about things. And, and, and nobody knows that better than the VPL group and others in this room. And so one of the things that we spun out of, again, sitting around a table and thinking, what other, what other gases, combinations of gases, temporal or spatial patterns in gases should we be prioritizing? And one of the things that came out really clearly from that was the possibility of looking at seasonality. That puts some constraints on our desire to have direct imaging. Um, and, it, and it, again, is grounded in the understanding of, of Earth. And so if I put up a CO2 curve, you would see CO2 increasing dramatically over the last 200 years, the Keeling curve. It would go from 300 to 400 ppm, and superimposed on that would be seasonal variation that's mostly reflecting a seasonal cycle between respiration and photosynthesis of plants on northern continents. And so that is very much a biosignature, even though the background level of carbon dioxide uh, is really high, and I suppose that's a biosignature because it comes from us driving our cars. But this idea of seasonal fluctuations and, and the possibility of, of looking at it in other gases as well, including, including oxygen, has really been intriguing for us. And so if you think about it, the oxygen and CO2 are completely antithetic. Um, what happens is that photosynthesis produces oxygen, respiration produces CO2. And so during the warm months, you're, you're producing lots of, carb, uh, lots of oxygen. During the cooler months, when respiration is dominant, you're consuming oxygen and releasing from that reduced organic carbon CO2 back into the atmosphere. We would argue that O2 might be better than CO2. It's because it's the solubility relationship is favorable. The solubility is lowest in the warm months, less solubility of gases in warm water when the production term is highest. And so it's possible, it's possible that even in the mid-proterozoic, you might have seen seasonality in ozone within that atmosphere where you to be looking. Today, CO2 is way too high, the baseline is way too high to imagine seeing those small few ppm variations. But as the sun brightens and the silicate weathering feedback brings CO2 down, the baseline down, 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 you could imagine time, but is it a billion years, maybe two billion years from now, where you might have detectable CO2 seasonality in a favorable signal to noise relationship. And so we published this paper just last year making those arguments. So what I want to do is, is, is thank you and also make a pitch. Um, and Vicki, excuse me, did you make an RCN pitch this morning? Did I miss that? You did not. So I'll make a bit, I'll make a bit of an RCN pitch. Many of you will know that the NAI is changing. Uh, it's changing dramatically into a network of five research coordination networks. And there will be a call um, that will be step one in September and step two in January for something called an ICAR, which will be large grants analogous to the existing NAIs. But the, the RCNs are much bigger than that. There are many, many, many teams that have been folded in by theme through the, the funding of a grant through Habitable Worlds or, or Exobiology. And, and I'm happy to be part of two of those. I'm a co-lead on the prebiotic chemistry and early earth environments team. And, and the focus of this is, is really about prebiotic synthesis in the earliest life with an emphasis in the Hadean. But what we're trying to do, I think, and I'm seeing so much movement in that direction already from people speaking here, is, is think about those reactions within a framework of what we know about the world, what it actually was like during that time. And then Nexus, which has been around since CAN7, and we are, uh, we are affiliated with Chris Reinhardt is on the steering committee. And through my association with the VPL, I'm tied to this um, anomaly as well. So you know, this is the future. And I would say, go read online. Uh, lots of exciting frontiers. It's a work in progress. There's still a lot to be done in terms of integrating among the different RCNs. But it's the best time is right now because it's all being sorted out by people like us. And I think that's it. I'll stop there. Thanks. Questions? Uh, your model will there's lower dissolved oxygen in solid ocean. Yeah. In that case, in biology, it wouldn't uh, tend to actually be. Uh, Nitrate. Nitrate, nitrate. Nitrate in that surface ocean, yeah. Yeah, 
Uh, that's that's a great question. Um, there, so let me not go into too many details. Like we could speak an hour on that, but so consistent with that. If you think about it, it's a step, an ocean that essentially was oxygen free to one that started to accumulate oxygen in the surface ocean to one that had transient events of oxygenation in the atmosphere. And I think that's sort of the history, right? We had this baseline and it's always about source sink relationships and it starts to do this and then it jumps up and it sort of relaxes and does this and it jumps up again. During that transition coming into the GOE, probably we increasingly had surface oxygen in the ocean but we also had these whiffs of oxygen in the atmosphere. So there's evidence for metal enrichments at 2.5 billion years ago in rocks before the great oxidation event. Coincident with this also, and Paul has published a paper on this, is that you see nitrogen isotope expressions of denitrification. So there is a suggestion that there was enough oxygen in the surface ocean to, to, to nitrify, and then because most of the ocean was still anoxic, plenty of eco space to denitrify and to start to get those large fractionations associated with that. There was the question about a really interesting point about how high the atmospheric pressure was as related to vesicles within basalts. That group from Washington has also looked at raindrop impressions and the size of those, how, how they vary through time. And it gets to your point, I'm not being digressive here, because really the point is that if Ava Stukin is right, nitrogen fixation began early, about 3.2 billion years ago, and that was stripping N2 out of the atmosphere. But it was much later in the Archean when we started to accumulate oxygen, that we had the return vector, that we started to oxidize ammonium to, to nitrate, and then nitrate to reduction and releasing N2 back to the atmosphere. So you could have had, in theory, some hundreds of millions of years where you were stripping N2, but not correspondingly releasing it. So those large fractionations, yes, could be interpreted as a biosignature. There are a number of other things at that time. There's selenium. There are many things that line up showing that progression of oxygenation just before the GOE. And it would make sense, right? Because it's not, some people would argue otherwise, but most people would say it was not the advent of oxygenesis by cyanobacteria. It was this tipping point between the, the, the reduced sinks decreasing and the production term increasing. And Josh has modeled carbon burial through that time. It's not a simple case of dramatic increases in organic carbon burial during that time, but, uh, but it is a combination of all these things. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so when you write at the end of your oxygen time block, there are some, there's some wiggles. Yeah, yeah. Wiggles you want me to go back? It's almost like a very good thing. So what are those? Yeah, well, thanks for asking. <laughs> those were slides I took out. <laughs> Here we go. So, um, so these are the whiffs of oxygen. Um, and, and this is the one at 2.5 that's pretty well constrained. These are from the Mount McRae shale, uh, same time period that Paul worked on. So you see in nitrogen, so, so many things. Um, the other ones are speculative, right? And at 2.7, there's evidence, Stephanie has worked on this and others, there is evidence for oxygenesis at that time. This is the Loma Gundy event. So it's the largest positive carbon isotope excursion in Earth history. It gets up to 10 per mil and lasts for a few hundred million years. If you take that at face value and think it's the barrel of organic matter, which is what drives heavy positive carbon isotopes, there's a lot of oxygen released with that. So more, the more popular idea now is that there was a release of a lot of oxidants, but we don't really know how high oxygen was during that time, but it's a really fascinating time to think about life, right? Because you had a at, mostly anaerobic world and suddenly it would, may have been pretty aerobic and that was toxic to pretty much everything that was living before. Then we enter this time period and again, trying not to generalize and saying it was a boring, it was a billion years of X. The more rocks we look at, we see a prevailing condition through this time period. I didn't show iodine data. That's another one of our famous favorite proxies, but it suggests that the surface ocean was in low oxygen at that time period as well, and may have had periodic mixing up of anoxic and sulfitic water. A hard time to make a living in the surface ocean. There was oxygen, eukaryotes were living, but the chemocline, that oxic and oxic uh, um, interface was really shallow. But the more we look at different data, in particular from 1.4 and in particular from North Central Australia, we see evidence for metal enrichments and, 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 and metal isotopes as well, expressions that there may have been an oxygenation event at that time. And there's a suggestion of one at 1.1, and then you could say, well, why don't you just connect those and say it was all there? Because most of the data say otherwise, right? These really stand out as blips. At 600, everything changes dramatically, but through this ediacaran interval, and it's a, another paper, a couple papers that we published, looking at spikes of metal enrichment, and it's also seen in the sulfur isotopes, uh, in particular in rocks from South China, 
So we think that there were pulses of oxygenation here. One of them seems to coincide with the fundamental shift in the, in the large animals present at that time. You can look at largeness as a measure of oxygen because of the surface area to volume relationship. And so there's a window at around 560 million years ago where the animals became a size that would be large, that would be consistent with pretty high oxygen. And then actually they go away and we think oxygen dropped again. So one of the frontiers is to try and tie independent paleontology to these independent measures of what the ocean and atmosphere may have been doing through that time. So these are actually, these are actually real. Um, what's, what's less known, ironically, is where, where this changes. So no one is really agreeing when the world became like today. Everybody would have said in the past that the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary, the Cambrian explosion, it was just finally we had this oxic world. You're not giving me this, you're not giving me that, but, you're getting, but that's not true anymore. And one popular idea is that you, it, was, it was not until the Devonian that we actually sort of fully ventilated, oxygenated the ocean. So we actually are spending a lot of our time looking at not just the Cambrian explosion, but the so-called GOBI, which is the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. It's when the, when the Phanerozoic fauna really starts to appear, and nobody knows exactly what the driver of that was. So, so these, uh, you know, with varying confidence, these are actually reflecting that sort of dynamic condition. And, and so here are the whiffs. Again, it's, you know, it's the production turning on here. Maybe the sink's waning, and you get these, and then you've, it's like you've crossed a tipping point, I think. And then, and then there might have been an overshoot and you relaxed back down, maybe because you were oxidizing or the organic matter that was deposited during this time period. And then this may have been triggered by, by Rodinia, by the breakup of Rodinia, and this may have been triggered by the assembly of Rodinia. You know, it, co correlation doesn't imp apply causation, but they're, we're, they're starting to see patterns across all these different independent data sets. And, and, and then similarly, we see this jump in perhaps a relaxation and variation through and this is, for example, assembly of Gondwana. So tectonics is really key. One of the things that we always think about in exoplanet exploration, is the, and, and June lives this, right, is the importance of tectonics for recycling phosphorus, for giving us not just continents, but emergent continents, and, and how do we know if they exist, and how important really are they? What is life like on an ocean world, for example? And, uh, and I think we're seeing this and this and maybe these things are all telling us that the first order changes and even the second order changes are reflecting tectonics. The ability to put nutrients in the ocean and the ability to bury organic matter and change the oxygen flux to the, to the atmosphere. We have time for one last question. Ken? Yeah. Uh, do you have any sense of when the uh, concentration? Yeah. Yeah, so, so there were the, the way that that is normally done is looking at the, isotope offset, the isotopic offset between sulfate and sulfide. And so there was a paper published by Shenandoah many years ago that, that argued for um, pretty large fractionations going back to 3.5. And so they said that that was at least there was sulfate reduction going on then. It could have been older, but that's the oldest known record other than molecular clocks for, for sulfate reduction. But, but most of this time period doesn't show very much fractionation. So then it comes to the lab. Let's culture X number of sulfate reducing bacteria across different sulfate concentrations. You have three of them. Is that representative of all the Archean? Probably not, but there was a popular idea of around 20, excuse me, around 200 micromolar. 200 micromolar, today it's 28 millimolar, right? So orders of magnitude lower. Now Sean Crow's group working, working on Matano, there's this great iron rich lake in Indonesia they've suggested that it may have been less than 20 micromolar, really, really low. But during the Loma-Gundi interval, you start to see sulfate evaporites. You actually see evidence for high sulfate. Um, you see also isotopic variability that's consistent with potentially even near modern levels of sulfate. Through this time period, most of the estimates are somewhere around a millimolar, one to two millimolar, so it probably dropped again, and then it rose again. So, good question. We're All done? Right, well, let's, uh, All right. let's thank him again. Thanks. Thank you.